Now, it's my pleasure to in present today's presenter, uh, or introduce today's presenter, Todd Snellgrove. Uh, Todd is a, a global subject matter expert in value buying and selling. And as founding partner of experts in value, he helps companies drive the value strategy from ideation to financial realization by making sure that value is created, calculated, communicated, and priced for. So with that, Todd, welcome. Nick, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for putting together your informative webinars as always. Let me move some slides over here. And... Think we should be good. Slide should be there up. We go. Perfect. So, what we want to talk about today is how do you sell value to this one group within the customer that seems to only talk about price? I mean, uh, the rise of the power of procurement uh, I've seen in the last 25 years in the marketplace. So, I want to talk about how do you engage these people, this function? What do they think about? What do they do and how do you communicate value to them so they're able and willing to pay for it? So I'm gonna talk about a concept called total profit added, which is really just an evolution of total cost of ownership. The uh, summation is I wanna make my customers more profitable. That's not just on the cost side, but there's the revenue side. So with that, we have a lot to cover. Um, hopefully, I don't want my message to be that the technical people, the people that use your product or service aren't the important people. They're the ones that realize the value of what you do and what you deliver. And whenever I say product, it could be service, okay? But they're the ones that realize it. But what I was told 20 something years ago when I started was go to the technical buyer, the user, the person that's gonna receive the value, stay away from the financial people, stay away from purchasing because all purchasing is gonna to wanna to do is negotiate price terms, conditions, and lower them. And what I found is that they can be the elephant in the room. They can cause problems. They can take orders away if you don't engage them early, often, and in the right way. So in addition to talking to the technical or the person that receives the value, we also need to talk to, at the same time, to the financial power. So the CFO, the chief procurement officer. So, you know, just to be, not to be too specific on terminology, but you know, there's a difference between purchasing and procurement. Purchasing is the tactical person that will write the purchase order, make sure all the T's and C's are crossed. They're very important, and I'm not minimizing that, but what I'm gonna talk about today is engaging procurement. If you want your customer to change the way they buy, to change the way they look at what you offer, it's important to get them to rethink that, and you know, the purchasing people might have a process they have to follow. Maybe it is three bids and a buy that meets the minimum criteria. If you want them to focus on value, fee at risk, differentiated value, delivered value, all that stuff, that's a procurement discussion at the C-level, chief procurement officer. So the evolution of the clerical price focus to the really intelligent world-class people that say, I want to receive best value from my suppliers. How do I do it? So we're going to start with a quick question, and hopefully you can use the chat function, or sorry, the question functionality. But everybody here has gone out to the marketplace and ended up in front of procurement at one point in their life. And they said, that's great that you have that great solution, whatever that is. But why do we think they are unable or unwilling to pay for that value? Why do, they, why do you think it's inherent that they push back against your value statement? So if people could just start typing it in. I've asked this question in varying uh, terminology for 20-something years now. Around the world, B2B uh, industries, which is my focus, and uh, it's amazing what I, you know, the general statement I get. So what I'm going to try to do here is try to do two things at once, which is not always the easiest for me. I'm going to try to look at the chat here and see if I can just see if there are people coming in and saying, you know, uh, in the question area, you know, okay, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm going to try the best I can, take whatever's written down. So uh, somebody's written commoditization. Just to add a clarification there, they believe what you're offering is a commodity or they're trying to commoditize everything or they don't understand that they're not commodities. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the one way to look at that is, you know, it's a commodity. 
price is the only difference. Oh, and I can't spell, so uh, my fat fingers don't. Uh, you know, by the time it gets to them, an apple's an apple's an apple. Who cares? And I think that's all I'm seeing so far. Nick, you seeing anything else? Not how I'm measured. Um, okay, it's, thank you. Because I'm not seeing. I'm just seeing the maybe I'm looking. At the, it's not how. So Nick, I hate to do this. Uh, not my business. No, I got. I got you. I got you. So. Um, I yeah. Yep. So this is my job. Um, well, uh, they yeah. don't believe it, or it's it's squishy. Uh, okay. Well, that's that's uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, value is soft. Gosh, Todd. Um, yeah, so, um, um, uh, it's I th another one about the, my, my boss, uh, my boss doesn't, uh, so that's, I guess that roll into, it's not how I measured. Um, and let me just see, I think I see one more. Um, yeah, so, so, um, like, uh, la, 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 la. I think it's a, a lot on, um, a lot on, uh, it's not my responsibility, boss, and then a few on. Uh, let's see the word substitute, um, or it's it's a commodity offering. So yeah, okay, okay, okay. I think I think we got the gist of it here. Yeah. And and, and, and as I put this back in this screen mode here, hopefully, uh, and switch this. You know, um, you know. Again, funny enough, I think we'll see. <laughs> I'm always waiting to see if there's a, another eight version that I haven't heard, but in general, you know, um, this is what you guys came up with commodity. It's not how I measured it's soft and it's someone else's responsibility. And again, this is the slide that I've got, you know, price is measurable. Value is not, I can see it. I can touch it a hundred versus 90 value is warm and fuzzy and I can't measure it. Um, something this didn't seem to come up, but price is immediate and value is long-term. And I had, you know, again, I measured on earnings per share for this quarter this year, you know, making my machine that lasts 10 years, last 12 years, I don't care. I'll be dead, retired, bought out by then. You know, I don't have the time to wait for the value. Yeah, price is guaranteed value is soft, probably the same as 0.1. This actually comes from a bunch of customers. Value programs take work. Yelling at you, threatening you with an RFQ, RFP, you know, to, to, to discount doesn't take much time. You know, so why would I invest a lot of time to get value when I can get price reductions by just threatening you? You know, I'm measured on price reductions, not value or TCO savings. That's somebody else's department. You know, I'm measured on this, this, and this. You know, that's maintenance, that's reliability, that's marketing's benefit, sales department's benefit, not mine. And and, and this, you know, is kind of a summary of uh, some research done by a professor. You know, in my opinion, the offerings are the same. They're commodities, as somebody pointed out. The minor differences where somebody's head office is or how many years they it's not worth my time or effort, you know. Where I get my cell service from, as long as it's one of the big three, my God, they look the same, they smell the same, the prices are the same. How much time and effort am I going to put into this? So with that backdrop, I think it's reasonable to assume why procurement would say, let's focus on price or other freebies that you're going to throw in. So let's, let's start with you know making sure we understand what I mean by value. Because it's a term that we shouldn't use. And my old title, you know, my, my business is experts in value. I was the vice president of value. But when you say value to procurement, I think you always need to follow up with when I say value, I mean making you more profitable, sustainably more profitable, long term more profitable, truly profitable. Because when you say value, this is what they're thinking in you know, the North American marketplace. And some of these examples are from other markets, but the value brand is the low price brand. When I say value, I do not mean low price. Okay. Now, just funny enough, this is a picture in Wisconsin. This person's put value and discount into their title, the value discount flooring. And I hope they're not listening in today, but they're making it very clear to them. Value means discount. It does not. So whenever I start a presentation or I use the word value the first time, I stop and clarify what I mean by value. Because I think if you leave that go by itself, 
value. Okay, I'm gonna leverage you for a discount. So this is the what I call the fishbone slide, but if your company's gonna take a value strategy, I mean, they kind of have those two paradigms. I'm gonna be the lowest priced commodity supplier, you know, follower, I have no differentiated value, and I'm just gonna sell on price. So I have, you can't sell on price, by the way. I give away on price. I don't need salespeople when price is my weapon. But if you're gonna take the value strategy out of my 25 years doing this and a bunch of research, I think there's a bunch of areas an organization needs to think through. It was first published in the first version, edition one of the book, you know, value first then price. What I think is really interesting from this book is not only did we look at best practices for companies that sell and price on value, but four or five, I think five procurement experts, which you'll see examples from them, that's where I learned this from, said, here's how I buy value. Here's what I do. Here's how I negotiate. Here's how I think when you salespeople say value. So here's some takeaways. This is the chapter I think you'll get from Nick with the slides afterwards. But a professor named Jim Anderson from Kellogg, now since retired, um, said, you know, how many CEOs say, you know, we're the value supplier in our industry, we want to sell value? Because they why doesn't it happen? They say they want to do it. Where's the difference between the direction and the realization? We broke it down into two areas, the ability to sell value, and then you get to the section, the section two we'll say in a moment. But number one, value conceptualization. When you're creating a new product or service or offering, have you put the value strategy into that discussion? You know, is it of value? And if so, what is it worth? What is the alternative? And is that a hard value or a soft value? And what am I gonna place on it? You would have no idea of how many huge companies I've worked for that spend a lot of money in research and development, launch products and services to the marketplace, and then they fall flat on their behind because there is no value built into it. And what I mean value just doesn't mean, you know, I'm an engineer, I can create value, but value from the eyes of the customer. And don't ask the customer, would you like? Would you like this functionality? Yes, I'd like that. If it's free, I would like that. Yes, I would like it if it makes the product less. Oh, that product's gonna weigh less, so therefore it costs you less to make. So yes, I would like it because the product would cost less. No, would you like this and it will cost about 10% more? Ooh, that's a different question. So really partly into your new market offering, whatever process you have, the value strategy. You know, structured questions along the way to say, what is the value going to be? Slapping the value message at the end doesn't work, or it's a lot of work. Is it part of your selling process? We'll talk about that in a minute because, you know, waiting till after you delivered something to write a business case so you can, you know, make marketing happy as an example is too late. It needs to be proactive. Here's what we think this is worth generically in the marketplace, your marketing message. Here's what it's specifically worth to, worth to you, Mr. Customer, based on my understanding of your business, your KPIs, et cetera. And then maybe we should actually measure what actually happens. You know, maybe we should come back. I thought it would reduce energy 10%. How's that doing? Oh, it's only saving 3% energy. Ah, you didn't align it. That's why. I mean, to make sure the customer realizes it. Do you have a sales tool to quantify the value? No more Excel spreadsheets. They don't work. Trust me. You wouldn't believe how many Fortune 500 companies have said, look at this and see what you see wrong. They've calculated return on investment wrong. They've overcomplicated it. They double count it. It doesn't look visually appealing. And believe it or not, the visualization of the value is just as important as the numbers. Because that report's going to get passed around that organization, and they love the cash flow break even and bar charts and stuff. Have you done the initial training? You know, understanding what is math? How do I quantify it? How do I ask the questions? The customer won't give me the information. What do I do? How do I do assumption-based selling? I mean, there has to be more than, ah, it's our normal value training, here you go. It has to be a little more meat around it. And is it ongoing? You know, it's not, you know, flavor of the year or the month, and here we go, and then it's forgotten about. So that's the ability side. Then we get into the implementation of the want to as a company. And this is where I find a lot of, you know, the rubber does not meet the road. So sales compensation. If your company measures your people on volume, sell volume, not profit realization, they'll find a way to cut a price. And kind of comes to point two value buying options. 
you know, and I spend 20% ah, of my time with procurement organizations. And these slides, I can tell you, are 90% the same. But anybody can put on a presentation saying I'm better value, but if they're not putting in a little fee at risk or saying, you know, I'll guarantee it or something, eh, it, you know, it's a marketing ploy. Maybe don't discount 10%, but put 10% fee at risk. Wink, wink. You're playing with their money, number one, and it helps you realize it, and it's actually better for them. I think I have a slide that will walk through that logic uh, later. But if, you know, my old CEO, I've given our sales team 400 ways to discount. Volume, end of quarter, key competitor, new business, ABC. I've not given them one tool not to drop the price, and I'm not paying them not to. And I had a salesperson once say, Todd, it's a million dollar order. If I cut it, we'll just say 5%. I'm still going to get 950,000. Is it worth, you know how much more work it is not to discount? I can go chase another order volume or I can go play golf. It's not worth my time. Publicly traded company with 10% net profit, 5% is half. I don't know about the businesses you're in, but there's not a new market opening up tomorrow. I better find ways to sell more at a higher price realization of the customers I have. Business culture, you know, is your CEO and management pushing it? Or are they saying, you know, get every order, I don't care, fill the factory, sell value. That's kind of a mixed message. At one point, we had our CEO say, we're going to walk away from bad business. We're training our customer that they can threaten us and leverage us at the end of the year and get a deal because we're going to chase it around. That doesn't work. And then finally, customer culture. Is your marketing, is your thought leadership really out there saying, hmm, maybe when I'm buying, insert quote unquote perceived commodity, I should rethink that. Maybe what this industry or that company offers brings more value than I thought. So big framework, it's something to think through. Price, cost, value, three different words, but people transpose them. Price is what you pay for something, $10. Cost is price plus and minus all the other costs. Price plus shipping, receiving, financing, energy, operation, disposal. We'll get into some specifics. So do you want a lower price or a lower cost? And I don't want to sound arrogant, but I have responded to customers that have said, your price is too high. I said, or I need a lower price. Why? Times are tough. We can't overpay. We don't have the budget. Do you mean you want a lower price or a lower cost? What do you mean? Well, no, a lower cost. No, no, two different words. And I've been at procurement conferences where they said, you know, we've gone back to suppliers and RFPs and said, you know, we need, uh, you know, because of ABC, cost reductions. 80 to 90% of the responses are price reductions. Look at every piece of marketing. Anytime you say those words, stop and think, is it price or cost? They're two different things. And values on the upside. You know, we'll talk about that as a specific example in a moment, but. You wouldn't believe how many times I've seen people, seen people transpose those terms. With procurement, you need to be specific. Price or cost reduction? Well, that's what I meant. Well, wait a minute. Here's how we can reduce your cost. So, the price perk, one of my favorite visuals. Yes, Mr. Customer, you can see the price. It's $100. But, you know, there's all these other things. How long it lasts, how much inventory, how do you receive it, how easy is it to use? How much energy, how much water, how much lubricant, how much ink, we can go on and on. But what procurement people tell me is salespeople don't do a good job of enumerating what those other things are. And if they do, putting reasonable representations of how much that means to them. You know, downtime. Eh, is it one hour or 10 hours? And if so, how much? You know, and not just figures in the air, but some reasonable representative numbers. They said, you don't give us that. You make us try to figure out what all those things are, and you make us try to figure out how to calculate it. I don't have the time or effort to do your job. That's a quote, by the way. So I would argue, Mr. Customer, it's whoever has the smallest price berg wins. Doesn't mean you know the water line doesn't matter. The smallest overall one wins. And when I'm at procurement conferences, I can tell you they want the slides, they want that one because they go, I'm trying to get my suppliers to understand this, and I'm going. Most of them get it. So I've talked about this concept of total profit added. Let me quickly try to explain to you what the difference is between this and total cost of ownership. So for 15 years, <clears throat> I would go to a university 
called Kellogg and do their business marketing management program with this professor named uh, Jim Anderson. And I would say, you know, what I want my customers to understand is it's total cost of ownership, but more, you know, because, you know, cost is only one side of profitability. And his comment to me was, Todd, you can't say TCO and then explain that it's different. Because when you say TCO, everyone's going to say, this is what I think it is. You need to come up with a new term. And I actually created this term on stage at Oxford in front of a procurement conference. Because I had just left Kellogg and I hadn't thought of another term. And you'll see a quote, I think, later with the professor, a procurement professor. He goes, what you're saying is we should measure our procurement decisions based on who brings us the most profit, which is not cost. And I said, yes. And he goes, well, total profit added. We both looked at each other and said, that's the term. That's it. So I'm going to walk you through a model here. <clears throat> My background's industrial, selling parts of machinery that go to big companies that put it in their machines. But this works for services, products, and B2B marketplaces, and works for B2C. I have a ton of examples, but we don't have time to go through all of them. But it starts with a company that builds a machine, okay? We're going to use a car example because I think it's going to fit in with a procurement example in a slide or two. So there are seven major car companies in the world, and there are a bunch of design engineers sitting somewhere, and they're saying, I'm going to take all these parts, put it together to build a car. And sales and marketing are telling me what that should look like, what the customer is willing to pay for it, what their priorities are. So they're sitting back and making design decisions, you know, how robust could this, if you said to an engineer, make this car last forever, they could. You know, make this car light, they could. It might cost a billion dollars, but they're making these trade-offs. But <clears throat> it's not a cost reduction, but what about time to market? In some industries, helping your customer get to market quicker than somebody else is worth everything. So in the high-tech world, it, speed to market is everything. Uh, I just found this out from a client. The number one sales uh, day of the year for North America for cell phone, mobile phones, is Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, for those of you not that are not uh, American. Number two is Valentine's Day. I thought it was very interesting to know that I can buy my girlfriend uh, a cell phone and get away with it. But time to market. You missed that window. It's worth everything. You have a new technology and you can beat your customer to market, it's worth everything. And there's a way to measure this. We don't have the time to go through this. Send me an, an email, we can have a quick chat and I can explain it. Uh, if you're in the patent industry, you have a drug, it's a 10 year patent, and the, you know, the packaging people can't get their stuff together, production machinery goes down, delivery systems, the marketing people can't get stuff ready, that's everything. What if you could help your customer increase the margin of what they sell their product for or sell more? Let's say you could add a functionality to this car that it's more energy efficient <clears throat> because it's lighter or whatever it is, or it's less maintenance because it does something. You could help them measure what their customers are willing to pay for that. That's not a cost reduction. But I can tell you, if I'm a VP of sales of a company, all I want to do is differentiate my product or service. You're telling me, supplier, you can help bring some technology to my customers to help me differentiate my offering. That's worth something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Somebody builds it. Now somebody buys it, the acquisition phase. Quick story, uh, 15 years ago, I was in South Africa and I had an uglier slide than this, believe it or not, and I was on stage and my CEO was there. First time he had to listen to me go through my whole presentation. It was great because he got the whole 90 minute presentation and he said to me afterwards, there's a bunch of things I wanna do, but one of them is I want you to meet our chief procurement officer. I pay our team, their KPI is cost savings. I hadn't come up with this total profit added terminology yet, but um, they measure cost savings. I pay them bonuses, whatever it was every year on it. But what he's talking about and what you're talking about are two different things. You know, maybe we should align this. So the point being your customer might say, we buy from suppliers based on best TCO. Say, so that's great. My company, ABC, we think we can affect 87 uh, profit drivers for companies like yours and the ranges of the following. They might come back with their idea of TCO is the acquisition phase. The price of the product or service plus where they need to buy it from, how close it is to their factories, how much the finance charges are, is there a return policy, who pays shipping, what's the currency, 
Uh, is there a tax write-off, yes or no? Those are landed costs, or what they might be viewing as total cost of uh, ownership. So just because they use the word TCO, stop, say, wait a minute. So somebody builds the machine, the car. Somebody's going to buy it, you or your company. Now somebody needs to install it, operate it, and maintain it. Use it, okay? So if you're using a printer or a laptop or a car or an engineering service or a lawyer, there's you know areas here, and this will be different, but take this slide, sit down with your people. How much energy, water, lubrication does it use? How long will it last? When it breaks, how much does it cost to fix it? Can I get parts to fix it? Wink, wink, some people sell machines at a low price, but have a captive aftermarket. They'll make all their money there. Does it affect my production, my throughput, my reliability? What's my installation cost? Do I need special tools? Is there taxation or credits? Are there warranty costs? Are there disposal costs? Oh, disposal. We don't think of disposal uh, usually as something to measure, but sometimes the disposal cost is the highest component of what you've bought, good or bad. I've got to tear it apart. I have to ship it somewhere. I've got to pay somebody to take used lubricant as an example and you know, send it somewhere. But maybe I could refurbish what the used product I have and resell it in the marketplace. So back to the car example. Two car companies design a car. They're both four-door cars. They're both gas. Just assume is what you want. You get to them. They look the same. They smell the same. They got different badges on them. One's 60,000, one's 50,000. Okay, they're both cars. They're both good, good quality. Uh, maybe I'll look at operating costs, fuel mileage. Have I bothered to check insurance? If there's sometimes a big difference of what it costs to insure based on probability of theft, ease of theft, et cetera. I mean, where I live might not change, but there's all these other things. Cost to repair. Maybe the lube oil and filter on one car is very expensive. Wink, wink. I think people know some car companies that are like that. You know, then finally, what's disposal cost? Maybe that $60,000 card depreciates to $30,000 over five years, but that $50,000 card depreciates to $15,000 after five years. If I pay $10,000 more to have an asset that's worth more, out, depreciates, to, well, these are the things we need to look at. So just a visual here, you know, the big costs are usually in the usage of the product or service, you know, but all those areas need to be thought about. One of my favorite pieces of research, spend some time, go to the research, you can find this information. This is Accenture, uh, it's, it's old research, but if any of you were to buy an airplane tomorrow, a Boeing, an Airbus, a Bombardier, the initial purchase price is 8%, 92% of its operating costs and disposal. Class eight trucks, I'm just gonna tell you because you get the slides, the big 18 wheelers you see. Industrial equipment, gearboxes, fans, motors, pumps, 12% and light duty pickup trucks for work are 12%. So, you know, I would say to my customers, you know, what's better, you know, the 10% cheaper piece of equipment or more expensive? Well, of course, the cheaper one. Well, what if the 10% more expensive piece of equipment had a 2% less operating cost? And a very senior educated person said to me, why would I pay 10% more to save 2%? Yet 10% of 12 is 1.2. 2% of 88 is 1.76. You need the denominator. The assumption is they will all use the same energy or the same amount of ink or have the same life. You know, one might be five years, one might be six years. I mean, we need to do a better job of understanding all those costs. So a smaller number on a bigger denominator might be much more important. So procurement and how do they think? This is one of my favorite slides. It comes from this great gentleman named Rob McGuire, who is a chief procurement officer of three or four huge companies. Uh, I won't name names, but he consults and but he was a customer of mine over the years. He goes, I know you have your sales processes and that's great, but have you ever thought of how I buy? Now let's go back to the car example, but trust me, they could be buying office supplies this way at a big company. Okay, so this walk through with me. A need's been identified. We use Nick. So Nick's married and he's got a kid coming and he's like, I need a different car. I gotta get rid of this two-seater car. I gotta get rid of this motorcycle. I need a family car. So a need's been identified or the other car broke 
or the lead, whatever, a need's been identified. He sits back and goes, what do I want? You know, I don't want diesel. I'm not saying his choices are right. I'm saying he's got his specifications. He's going to say, I want gas. I don't want electric. Why? I don't know. He might, there might be numerous reasons, but he's going to say, I want a gas four-door car as an example. And then he's going to say, you know, there's seven, eight car manufacturers in the world. You know, I really like GM, but I don't like Kia, but I really like Volkswagen. Well, Tesla's off because they're only electric. He's going to narrow that down to suppliers that meet those criteria so far. Then he's going to say, I'm going to go visit them. You know, in the business world, an RFP, RFQ. He's going to go talk to them. Here's what I'm looking for. And here's what I want. What do you got? What deal do you got for me? Who meets these specifications that I've already decided better? Don't start talking to me about things I don't care about. They're going to give his offers. He's going to negotiate which one price terms conditions. He's going to buy the car, agree on the contract. And then hopefully he measures. That's kind of, you know, how good did it do? Am I going to buy it again? And Rob's point is you can affect my decision, but only at the beginning of the process. If down in the RFQ stage, when I'm meeting you, you say, hey, Nick, you should think electric. You, I don't want electric. It doesn't meet my range. It doesn't do this. I don't like this. You know how much work you need to do to reconvince somebody once they've already made a preconceived you know, mindset of what they're going to measure? My old colleagues used to bring me in that, that point. It's a lot more work. <clears throat> Talk about the challenger. That's when you really need to do this stuff. So your sales and marketing really needs to be upfront in the buying thing. I say, next time you buy a car, think about these things. Measure it this way. This is what value is. This is the way to frame that. You could take this uh, idea and walk it through any business buying decision. So whether it's office supplies or industrial products or engineering services. And real quickly, you know, just to kind of take some uh, research, Gartner said that out of 750 B2B buying scenarios, 27% of the buyer's journey is researching independently online. This is B2B. So that's the big chief buying officer or procurement officer, whatever it is, they do some online research. Then they talk to the internal people afterwards. What do you really want? And just because you like that guy or they've always been our suppliers, not going to count as a specification. You know, then they're going to do some more independent research offline, probably trade uh, associations, uh, friends in the business. Have you ever bought this before? What worked? What didn't work? What should I be careful about? Asking around. I don't know what doing other is. 17% of the overall total buying journey is spent with meeting the, the three suppliers. So if you're one of the three, you're getting less than 6% of their buying time. And in 6% of the buying time, you're trying to say, look over here, look at value, look at how we can measure value. Damn right, that's important, but your marketing needs to get them to rethink. I should look at total value, total profit, total cost of ownership evolved. Next time I look at, insert what you uh, sell. This is interesting. Uh, procurement people, they are all taught this. You know, it's from a seminal article from 1983. I'm going to try to out the person's name, Peter Kraliak. It's called the Kraliak Matrix. But it's when purchasing must become supply chain management. And they said that every year, take all your suppliers and measure them on this matrix. And then you will negotiate with them differently based on where you put them in. So on the x-axis is spent. The bigger they are, dollar-wise, the more time you should spend with them. And he wrote, God, how many years ago, risk or business contribution being the y-axis. He wrote that. I don't see 99% of the people implementing it that way. Let me show you why. Bottom left quadrant, nuisance. Relatively low, relatively, important word, low dollar and low risk. Risk is, are there other suppliers in the marketplace? Yes. You know, there's two other people that sell similar things, and it's not my top 10% of my spend. That's a nuisance. I'm going to reverse auction them. I'm going to say I want EDI supply chain. That's going to be three bids and a buy. I don't have the time or effort to do strategic bid here. Okay? If they're really big, but I can substitute them easily, I'm going to leverage the crap out of him. I mean, here's the extreme examples of the three bids and a buy. 
you know, there's three big suppliers. It's new volume. Let's, I want rebates. I want this. I want this. My cost to switch is low and you all meet the specification. I, that's where procurement's the happiest. Low spend, but high risk. And when they mean risk, what I see most people say is, is supply risk. You know, offshore is a problem now. There's a constrained market. The demand exceeds supply in certain markets. You know, like, you know, it's like, whoa, I better have long-term partnerships with these people. I better have first right of refusal. They better guarantee me supply. I mean, great spot to be in if you can be in it. Congratulations. Make sure you price appropriately. And then what we all say we are, we're strategic. What's funny, if you say to suppliers, us, are we strategic to our customers? Most people will say yes. If you ask customers, they say no. My office supplier, my industrial parts supplier, my this supplier, my energy supplier is not strategic. There's three people that I can change that pipe to tomorrow. Yeah, there might be in today's world, might be. Now, the point here is they want to push everybody down as much as possible. What we need to do is get them to rethink that and say, you want to know what? It's not spend it that matters. It should be profit improvement. Should you spend your time with the $100 million supplier or the $10 million supplier? Well, the $100 million. The $10 million supplier that can create a million dollars of profit by ABC is more important than the $100 million supplier you bounce back and forth three times for a half million. Your switching costs are higher. So the only way to get them to rethink it is to put a dollar amount to it. Horrible, ugly slide. I know it, but I'm not going to change it. The first time I did this, I, I drew it out on the board, was arguing, sorry, discussing with a customer, and I was saying to them, you know, I'm going to guarantee 10% annual value. And when I mean value, I mean hard stuff. And he said, well, I've got a 10% price savings. Now, here's the market dynamics. My competitor's offer would be held for the life of the contract. We'll just say five years. Yeah, we'll say price increases exist, but uh, let's be realistic. But if, if there was a CPI price increase, both sides would do it, so it doesn't matter. This is the important note of it. You know, improvements become sustainable. Once you learn how to reduce energy consumption, it stays reduced. Once you have less inventory, it stays reduced. Once you make your machines last longer, they last longer. Once you learn how to do taxation, closing your books faster, it stays done. You have something you've learned and operationalized and systemized. And I'm going to assume that the price savings become cash. So best case scenario for the price seller here. They don't get lost somewhere else. So his view was, take, I'm just going to say a million dollar chunk of business, 10% price discount, it becomes 900 grand, done. And Todd, and I use energy just because you know, it's always is, it's measurable. He goes, okay, at the end of year one, I'm no better off with you than him. 10% is measurable. And it's guaranteed. And I said, well, you want to know what I'll do? Is I'll guarantee you the 10%. And he goes, okay, but at 10% price, 100 grand, now you're going to guarantee me 10% energy. Well, if not, I'll write you a check. He goes, okay, now I'm getting closer. Yeah, but it's still, you know, why? One's easy. The other one, I got to trust you. We got to meet. We got to talk. Why? Yeah, because mine's worth more. And trust me, I, 2017 and 18 at the bottom, it was the slides much older than that. But next year, this is your value proposition, by the way. I'm going to work on inventory reduction. The total amount of inventory, strategic inventory, uh, re reduction of inventory. So another 10%. So 10% of 900,000 is 90 grand. My competitor does not drop their price 10% per year. They drop it 10% and hold it for five years. Now I'm going to make the machines last longer by doing the magic that I do. Now I'm going to reduce the lubricant cost. These might not be products or services that I sell. Well the services around it. Now I'm going to work on helping you increase your machine speed or reduce downtime. Well, it turns out that a 10% price reduction is worth 10%. A 10% annual operational improvement is worth 26%. So the math is what's better, 500,000 or 1.3 million? And he kind of went, wow. He said, and I'll guarantee that, by the way, number one. And number two, if I exceed the 10%, you get free. I mean, I can't just stop at 10%. Maybe it becomes 12. You know, maybe I want to count that number towards next year, but that ugly variation drawing on a board got 200 orders with Fortune 5, like uh, Fortune 1000 companies. 
or it was guaranteed value. And again, we were going to drop the price 10%. So now we just said, I'm not going to drop it. I'm going to guarantee value. Well, why is value better than price? This ugly slide helped explain it. Love this lady. She's from an event that I did years ago, head of a procurement association, a drug company at the time, AstraZeneca. Suppliers don't come to us with a business case. It's what we want. Sell your value using our numbers to get our attention. And my favorite line, if you can't quantify your value, don't be surprised at the failure of procurement to do so. Todd, all you do is sell this. You know what I got to do? I got to buy this. If you can't put a number on this, I don't have the time, effort, or knowledge to do it. Okay? So you do your homework. Anybody here that sells to government, we don't have the time to go into detail, but government does care about value. This ugly slide on the right, there's an article on how to buy based on total cost of ownership. But on the right is from the Defense Acquisition University um, training course that the University of Tennessee uh, designed and put together for them. You can see the price per there. So two real slides on procurement here. I'm not saying you ever go to procurement and say this, but I'd never heard the term moral hazard. But it's something I think we run into all the time. Moral hazard is a situation in economics when somebody that's making the decision doesn't face the risk of that decision. You know, I'm the chief procurement officer. I'm sitting at head office. You know, you're talking about company cars. I don't drive cars on the field. You're talking about travel, whatever. You're talking about something that I don't have to deal with. So two great visuals. I mean, this is an old one from Bloomberg, but you know, let's all go spend our money, money and hope the Fed just bails us out. So hopefully that gets a chuckle. And this is one of my favorites that I was sent, you know, speeding ticket insurance. No premium, the premium doesn't go up. So imagine that. I could pay a fixed fee, and every time I get a speeding ticket, somebody else would pay for it. Would I care? So this is a problem we have, and the only way to get around this is to get to somebody higher up. Because a company makes profit, not a department, not a North American subfunction. I know this is asking, how do you go higher? But this is why, to get to that person that looks at the good of the whole. Earnings per share is a company, not a, you know, a sub-segment. And, you know, I, the title maybe needs to be updated, but everybody adds value beyond the product that they deliver or the service they deliver. So, you know, the customer asks you to come in, and consult with them. Okay, fine, I need to look at new office supplies. I need to look at whatever I need to look at. And they ask you a lot of questions and you bring your smart people in there. And there's a difference between consultation and free consultation. Because in most markets I deal with, the difference in the product or service is very limited, very limited. So it's the people around it that add all the value. So if I can extract that value, I will. And in our personal lives, we call it showrooming. We'll just say, for example, has anybody ever gone to Best Buy, spent an hour with one of their smart people, TV, what type of TV, how many inputs do I need, what refresh, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. What's your price? Interesting. Then they go home and shop it online and figure out where they can get it cheaper. There's a good chance you can get it cheaper somewhere else because they don't have that sales cost. What the buyer has done, you as the procurement person or businesses, is they've unbundled the value in the buying process. They've taken your knowledge and then gone somewhere else. And so this is a comment from this chief procurement officer, Rob, and he was Scottish, so he had a, an accent. But Agree on the get before you give. I'll give you this much knowledge to show you I know something, but if you want the full Monty, I'm going to deliver that as long as you agree that I get the agreement or the contract, or I'm going to charge you, and then I'll waive the fee if you buy from me. But you're not getting a hundreds of hours of free engineering advice on the hope you're going to buy it from me. Because if you are, I will string you along. And, you know, anybody that's ever used a pure knowledge consultant, a lawyer example, you get the one hour or whatever for free. After that, you're being charged. They don't give you the answers. Because if they do, if it's the paperwork to be filled out, I can go online and fill out the paperwork. So he called this a strategy of stupidity, and I thought it was hilarious. He goes, it's funny. The more I acted stupid, the more I said I didn't care about your value, the more you guys came in and were like Superman and gave it to me. I don't care if you can reduce my energy. I don't care about inventory. Who cares if it blah, blah, blah. You engineers, you technical people went home and came back and gave me even more value. 
So the dumber I was, the more work you did for free. So I will always play dumb. I don't care. Let me make another point here from a great gentleman that I do some work with. That's the time to walk away and say, okay, you don't care about inventory reduction? Okay, fine, then we won't do it. Well, wait a minute, you said you could. That's going to cost us ABC. You just said there was no value to that to you, so we won't do it. Or you won't pay me to do it. Ooh, if you don't walk away and pull it away, they'll keep taking stuff for free. How many times the examples he gives where the customer said, oh, I, I, but I want that. You just said you weren't willing to pay for it. it. It cost me money to do. You're not willing to pay for it, so why would I do it? Okay, maybe I'll pay for it now. So start pulling things back. If the customer says I don't value it, then pull it back. And this is another interesting one for smart people. You might have systems or processes or people that say, we've done this 100 times, we can do it. It's easy for us to do this. Because that actually makes me not want to pay for it. If it's easy, you don't need to tell me it's easy to do. And this is what consultants do. Ah, we're going to bring the team in. We're going to do this analysis. We're going to do. They might already have the answer in their back pocket. They might not do all the investment of the time and effort. But the second you say how easy it is to do, he's not going to want, or she's not going to want to pay for it. So you kind of said, you know, last thing here is, I might not be able to give you the order, but I can take it away from you if I don't want you to have it. So kind of at the end here is I'm going to speed up, believe it or not, is you know, we're seeing more and more performance-based contracts, pricing offerings, where people say, you want to know what, here's my fee, and then here's some fee at risk. Option one, or 100% outcome-based. I'll pay you, you know, by the, the movement, by the outcome. It's not a theory anymore. But every company should be sitting back and working on, you want to know what, this is the extreme. What I talked to you about in that really ugly slide, the 10 versus 10, is I'm not going to discount 10%. I'm going to put 10% of fee at risk. Never wrote a check. Win supplier awards for doing it. But more and more companies are doing this, and procurement wants us to do it. So this is a professor, Corey Billington. You know, procurement's not going to change. It's our job to get them to want to change, to see the value in changing, and to see why what you sell is an area they should focus on. They're not going to wake up one day and go, ah, geez, never thought of it. I'm just going to say, office supplies, I should really rethink this. They've made a decision it's a commodity and they're gonna buy it that way. We've gotta do something to make them rethink. Business cases and dollars are the only way to make them do it. This is from the book that was actually written for a journal article. This is from a chief procurement officer, my old one. And he says, the way our old best practices were price, quality, delivery. Do you meet quality, minimum quality? Can you deliver? After that, it's price. Other factors, who cares? I love the third one, relationships. He said to me, he was Swedish, Todd, BTI, BTU. And I said, pardon? He goes, it's a strategy. It's on our calendar for supplier management. BTI, BTU. What does that mean? Bring them in and beat them up on a regular basis. Never admit their value. Constantly hammer them so they keep, you know, are ready to discount when need to. Short term, et cetera. The future. Value, innovation, differentiation performance-based contracts, sustainability, risk, agility, collaboration, long-term, completely different. So there are journal articles in procurement associations and articles that talk about this. This is a great second, last, third, last slide is, so this is a chief procurement officer did a survey and he asked procurement people, how often do sales representatives' proposals address value in them? And I saw this, I was at a conference and I just, you know, my heart sunk. Sometimes and seldom and never is 80, whatever, 89%. 89%, sometimes I don't count as very good, by the way. So procurement's point was 89% of the time, I don't get a real value measurable beyond some, you know, 100 year old company, you know, this much inventory, they have this many people statements, you know. But then they asked, you know, <clears throat> salespeople about procurement. How much do, does procurement want us to do this? How much does procurement care about value? You know, they disagree, never strongly disagree as the same, like 75%. So, you know, procurement saying they want it on the left, but we don't do it. Salespeople are saying procurement doesn't ask for it. I don't care if the customer asks for it or not. Proactive respond, do you want total cost value analysis done 
or I guarantee you best value. You've started a different discussion. You might, that buying circle, you might be able to get them to pop them back up to the top. And as we come to an end here, you know, what I'm talking about is not just theory. A bunch of academic research, and it's not just theoretical stuff, but you can see some big schools around the world um, have done this, and they all get variations. Some are buying on value. Rotterdam School of Management and University of Tennessee, and I think RMIT, if you remember, yeah, or Macquarie. Yeah, these are all schools that have had done research with me and had me come over to explain how to buy best value. And then you can see marketing best value, Kellogg, pricing, London, and Harvard. Either way, these schools have said value, value quantification is one of the biggest differentiators and most important things in the marketplace. These are procurement associations that have had me come speak. And I can tell you the slides are 90% the same. You know, I've tried to put as many as I can in here. National Institute of Government Procurement, North America. PASIO was Asia, CPO, I don't remember. IBE Corp was Latin America. ISM, I'm doing at the end of September, or yeah. CAPS is University of Ten or Arizona, Center for Advanced Procurement. Either way, tons of procurement saying, we want to buy value, how do we do it? How come suppliers aren't bringing it to us? And some governments that are putting into you know how they buy, that value has to be quantified, value must be listed, and then a bunch of associations. So real quickly, you know, we have structured tools and processes to measure value. You know, I can make it annual. You know, your paper machine doesn't need to go from 10 years to 20 years. I can make it an annual guarantee of value. Uh, I can make it hard. I, you know, I, I won't charge you to, to do a free training. Everybody is free training. I won't charge you to rush ship it. Everybody is rush shipping. Free stuff is not value. It can be the rounding errors but it can't be the whole part unless I'm really used to paying for it. You know, they take work. I got to show you that, you know, if it's going to take work and quote unquote, there might be a risk because I'm making you change how you think that it's worth more. That 10% versus 26% slide does that. I'm not saying they got every order, but I can tell you when I got to the C level of a company, I always said, that's what I want. Hard value delivered and guaranteed. So if I was talking to the wrong person, you know, I'm going to help you show your organization how you can bring more value. Sometimes we had to go higher. But if there's that customer that's price, 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 three bids, go higher. I think there's, I'm making up numbers, as you can tell. I think we could save you a million dollars over the next three years. Would you like to have a meeting? You'll get a call back. Yeah, you might upset the, the purchasing person you're talking to, but if you can't get through that company's mindset, put a number out there. They look the same. They smell the same. You know what? I'll put some fee at risk. I've got tools, processes, backgrounds, examples, but I'll put some fee at risk. If you can discount 10%, you can sure as heck not discount 10% and put 10% at risk. So takeaways, use your own procurement team to role play your presentations. They're a great asset. Get early within the customer, try to get higher, use some numbers. Words are great, numbers are more important. Be willing to use some fee at risk. I mean, again, if you can discount, if you're batting or your walkaway points X, maybe stop before that and use guaranteed value. We didn't have a chance, but I use this minimum break even as a, as a closing strategy. Always agree on what value is before you enter into an agreement. You know, or say, okay, you don't value labor savings? Fine, then we won't do this to save labor. Oh, but, but I want that. Well, you just said you didn't value it. So agree on what value is, and if they say they don't want it, don't do it. Like work hard not to deliver it because amazingly enough, there was somebody I wanted that. Well, then that needs to count and it needs to be paid for. Quantify it when it happens. Don't wait three years into the contract and go in and dump a bunch of value stories on them. Quarterly, sit down. Here's what's in process. Here's what we're working on. Here's what we think it's going to be worth. Because I can tell you when it happens, it's worth a lot. Three years later, I won't remember it. Story tell when you're presenting. Very important. And I know the Leverage Point team brings this up all the time. I mean, um, you really got them to, when you're talking risk and reliability, storytelling is very important. Have a list of trade-offs to negotiate with. It's not just price. The customer is the hero, not you. And this is a really interesting one. Get your own company to buy in value. Because I can tell you one of my favorite closing techniques was my CEO says this, hey, here's a picture of my chief procurement officer. I sit on his team now making sure we buy. You know, this is our tool we use to quantify value for our customers. Guess what? Here's the same tool we use to buy in best value. It's not a look over here scenario. And people are like, wow, 
you guys really believe in this? And then have an expert to really support it. We won't go through all this. You get the slide, but a bunch of proof that people that buy this way are more profitable. They're 35% more profitable. And in the middle, a bunch of quotes from a bunch of high level people saying, we've got to buy value. You know, we really got to extract that from our suppliers and that's not price. So price will be the focus unless you can quantify it. And here are my digits and information. LinkedIn's at the bottom there, email address. And with that, we finally get to Q&A, Nick. Sorry Great. Um, thanks. No, no worries. Great presentation. Um, and so we did have a couple questions and you can indicate that uh, if you want to reach out to Todd, also indicate that in the exit survey and the webinar as well. Um, so I think we have time for a couple. Um, so how about this? Let's talk about, I got one on value chain, which is interesting. So um, a lot of the value is delivered to someone up the value chain, say raw materials, but um, you're trying to sell to the kind of the, the, the next, the next link in the chain. Um, any, uh, any advice for that? Great question. So your customer's customer is what I want to understand. You know, the value gets realized further down the value chain. <clears throat> One is to, I mean, to have a sales, sales and marketing and research done with what is that value there? I, I'll go back to my world. I create a park, goes to a big OEM, but that big OEM's machine helps the mine make more money. So I could talk to that OEM, look, your machine's gonna be better, faster, stronger, but the mind gets the value. So going to the mind to do the research, saying this is worth this to your customer, then going back to that OEM in this case, saying, hey, let's create a marketing one-page sheet that your sales force can use to go to your customer and say, look, we've chosen to add this functionality to our machine or this quality to our machine or whatever it is, this is what it's worth to you. Help them sell your value to their customer. Does that help, Nick? Yeah, no, and we see this in manufacturing and oil field and a number of sectors. Um, so no, that's a uh, great answer. Um, so I think uh, let's let's go with um, this one's kind of a good general one, but introducing fee at risk. Um, you know, what are some um, pushbacks if they don't take the bait, I guess? And I think you've walked through a couple um, during the presentation, but um, disarming these pushbacks if they, if they, um, you know, they, if, if you say you're introducing fee at risk for the first time. Well, I mean, first question, I mean, your own company's internal risk or the customer's uh, pushback? Because yeah, it's I, customer I pushback. More, okay, okay. Because by, by the way, I get more companies that push back. We can't mm. do that. We don't have the processes. That's a whole different discussion. But the customer, I mean, what I found most of the time, they just say, well, then fine. Well, well, fine. Well, some of the pushbacks might be, well, how much time or effort will this take? I don't have access to the people to get the numbers. So what I've worked with is companies to have a structured process. Here's what it is. We walk the facility day one. Day two, we sign an NDA. Day three, you share us your KPIs. We do ABC analysis. We come back with four ideas. You get a, a structured process. What they don't want is you saying you're gonna do this and then run around and take up all their time and effort. They can't have 50 suppliers doing this all at the same time. But it, if you have a structured process to do this and to bring a lot of the information to them, that seems to minimize it. Um, showing them that there's more value with the fee at risk versus um, the price. Great. You know, so, you know, do you want 5% price structure or 10% hard value? Now you're making me make a choice. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes it helps them be, you know, remember a lot of customers, and, and this is from a salesperson and a marketing person, but the people within their business aren't fans of their own procurement people. Think about your own company. I mean, I, I, I've gotten to like procurement people, but I used to think of them as they're the people that try to get me to spend less and, 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 and not buy what I want. Mm -hmm. So if you can get to those, if, if the, the end users, the people that get the value, you know, they'll help push back. Mm. No, and uh, great, great. Um, and I think that's probably consistent with a lot of people's experience. So um, if it's okay, we probably uh, maybe take some of the other questions offline and we can answer them in our post-webinar blog post or one-to-one. -one. Um, so just real quick, uh, we're going to be do, doing something interesting next month. Um, so you can pre-register in our exit survey. Um, we're going to be uh, 
over the next couple of weeks conducting our first ever state of value management survey. And we'll be um, collecting thoughts from you, the audience, and the wider value-based community on the state of value strategies and value selling in their organizations. So uh, we're hoping to learn a lot, aggregate knowledge. And then later at the end of October, we'll be sharing some of the most interesting findings alongside a panel of practitioners and experts. Um, so it should be really informative and fun. So if you'd like to take a part of it, we're still locking down the date. Um, just make sure to pre-register in the exit survey and we'll get those details to you uh, when we have that locked in. Um, and if you just want to move to the next slide and yeah. that will be it for us today. So thank you, Todd, as always, um, for joining us as an informative presentation. And from all of us here at Leverage Point, have a wonderful rest of your week. Take care. Thanks, Dick.